When I was growing up, I lived in the countryside in rural southern Ontario, Canada. And I remember being a little three-year-old kid running around outside as my parents bought and built our family home. I think I have like two solid memories of myself being really young and playing on the unfinished lawn as all the wood framing was still going up. And after it was done being constructed, it became my example of buying and living in a house and creating a home for your family. Now, as I got older, I realized that I was probably more of a city person myself. I really loved visiting Toronto. And whenever I went to stay with my aunt and uncle who lived in a nearby city, the thing that I would always ask to do as like a fun activity was to ride the city bus. And yes, that's just the regular public transportation, but I would call it a city bus and make it like this really exciting thing. I also spent a lot of time daydreaming about moving to New York City one day. So basically it was safe to say that I would probably end up living in a bigger city myself. But either way, whether I was going to be living in the countryside or in the heart of the city, young me still thought that as soon as I was an adult with a job and earning money, I'd be buying a house wherever that was gonna be that I was living. Cause it's just what you do if you can. If we fast forward to me now, who is an adult with a job earning money, I realized there's more to the conversation about homeownership than I originally thought. As a kid, I just knew that my parents had a house, it was a priority, and that they told me that one day I'd buy a house too. And a lot of people have a similar experience now where their parents want them to buy a house as soon as possible because it's a sign of stability and it also kind of means that you're doing well and succeeding financially as an adult. And it's not just our parents that are telling us this messaging, it's kind of everywhere. I wanted to really dive into where this pressure and the idea of homeownership needing to happen and needing to happen ASAP really comes from. And if it's an actual valid and realistic thing for us to even be striving for. So we started off by asking our Instagram followers a few questions and here's what they said. The first thing we asked is, do you want to buy a home one day? To see who actually wants to buy a home and if we're right, that a lot of people do. And it definitely seems like we were on the right track with that one because a total of 89% of people said they do want to buy a home. 67% said they still want to in the future and 22% already have bought a home. So all those people are in the wanting to buy a home category. Then we asked, do you think you'll actually be financially able to buy a home one day? Now that's the whole other story. Over 50% of people said no to this question. 26 specifically said that they don't feel like they'll ever be able to afford it. And then another about 27% of people said that they don't think they'll be able to buy a home where they wanna live. They'd have to move somewhere else that's cheaper with a lower cost of living. Luckily, some people did say they feel like they'll be able to afford it, which is great, but still we see a big drop off between these people who wanna buy a home, but think that they'll never be able to. And then we also asked people because we thought it'd be interesting to see if they don't think they'll be able to buy a home, why not? The biggest answer here was definitely home prices and home unaffordability, just how crazy high everything is. And some people also said they don't feel like they make enough money as well, and those two kind of go hand in hand. And the last thing we also wanted to know from people is just any other thoughts they have on home affordability in general and thoughts on buying a home. There was a few patterns to this. One, a lot of people brought up interest rates again, so they feel the pressure to buy a home quickly, even though interest rates are high right now and that's definitely freaking them out. Um, and then the last thing too is people feeling like you need to be with someone else, married or have a partner, have two incomes basically in order to be able to afford it. So overall, people are clearly feeling the pressure, but why are they actually feeling that pressure and why is it there? The history of home ownership is like a really, really big topic, but I wanna take you guys through the basic high level overview of how it's evolved, specifically here in North America where we're located. Now, you can see here that in Canada, we've seen a steady increase in home ownership since the 1970s with an even steeper incline during the 1990s. Now, basically the same exact trend is what we've seen in the US. So if you look at right before the, the 2000s, that's where we saw this really, really steady growth of home ownership. Now, apparently this was brought on by Bill Clinton's national home ownership strategy, where he claimed that home ownership is not only great at strengthening families, but it was also great at stabilizing communities. Basically, he believed that home ownership overall was great for the people, communities, and the economy. And listen, this idea wasn't new, right? Like throughout the 1900s as a whole, as people started to gain more wealth and the demand for housing started to go up, the idea that owning a home equaled the American dream or the Canadian dream really started to become solidified. Then we started to see the fall of home ownership in the early 2000s. Like here in Canada, it peaked in 2011 and then slowly started to decrease from there, which is clearly tied to the 2008 financial crisis, of which we've never recovered to the same rates ever since. But clearly the pressure to buy a home is still there, right? Like you still hear people say that they would still buy a home if they could afford it. But, and this is a big but, there's been a lot of changes in the real estate market over the past several decades. So even if our emotions around wanting to be homeowners haven't changed, the circumstances around our ability to actually become homeowners have changed. Obviously the cost of buying a home is a pretty huge part of that. Like for example, here in Toronto, the average price for a home is just over $1 million. And that includes all types of homes. So that means condos, townhomes, other homes, you name it. 
Now, what's interesting is that in 1996, of the year that Steph was born, the average price of a home in Toronto was just below $200,000. Now, even if we adjust that for inflation, that's a pretty huge price difference in a really short period of time. This either stops people from being able to buy a home or they buy a home that they can't really afford even if they're allowed to buy it, or they buy a home that's further and further away from their community, where they work, or where they actually wanna live. The thing about house prices rising is that it doesn't mean that less homes are being bought, it means that less people can afford to buy a home. And the rise of real estate investing has been real over the last several decades as well. And the core issue with this isn't usually the smaller investor that has a few properties, it's these larger organizations that buy up so many homes and drive the overall cost up even more, because the focus is rarely on creating more affordable homes. Instead, it's on revamping and renovating to drive up these home values as high as they possibly can be. All of this to say that it's harder for people to buy a home now than it was in the past, but it doesn't mean that people don't still want to buy a home. Like, you know how people always tend to divide us into the older and the younger generations when it comes to the home buying debate? With the older generation telling the younger people that they should buy a home, and the younger generation saying that they would, but they just can't afford to. Well, what I noticed from that debate is that the younger people aren't saying that they don't want to buy a house, it's just that they feel like they can't, just like the results of our polls mentioned. Like the conversation of forced savings. It's true that buying a home means that some of the money that you're paying towards your mortgage every month ends up going back to you, because you're building equity up in the home and eventually it'll become something that you fully own. There's also the stability you feel because you can't have a landlord kick you out, for example. Although it is really important to remember that unless you paid outright for the home, you don't fully own it at first, so technically the bank could kick you out. Then there's also the consistency and payments that you know to expect, the ability for you to renovate and customize and change up your home, and it also might just feel really good to own your own home. So when it comes to the pressure we feel to own a home as soon as possible, we'd say we agree that sometimes buying a home can be a great thing and it's something to work towards, but there should be no as soon as possible pressure. That's really the biggest issue here, and it's what gets people to buy homes that they can't actually afford, and it's what gets people to rush into buying a home before educating themselves on real estate and before deciding what's actually right for their personal finances. One big thing that needs to be considered is that yes, buying a home can sometimes be cheaper than renting and your mortgage payments do partially go back to you, but there are more costs involved with owning a home. I actually read somewhere that your rent is your maximum payment, whereas your mortgage is your minimum payment, which I think is a really great way to look at it. Like on a monthly basis, you pay your mortgage, but you also pay your property taxes, insurance, maybe some condo fees, maybe some fees to maintain the property, something that your landlord would typically do if you were renting. So you have to be in a good financial position to really pay for all those monthly costs. Then when it comes to actually buying a home itself, there's the down payment, the closing costs, inspection costs, legal legal fees, and a whole bunch of other costs. And ideally, you'll also have an emergency fund saved that's separate from all of that money, just in case something unexpected happens. Okay, I'm jumping in for a second because one of the biggest and most consistent payments that you can actually have some control over is your mortgage. And that's why we're excited to be collaborating with True North Mortgage today. For all of our Canadian viewers, you definitely wanna hear about this. They've been around for 20 years now and it was started to provide better mortgage rates to Canadians. And they do this in a few different ways. One, the team is really collaborative and works together because they don't work on a commission basis like mortgage brokers typically would. On top of that, because they work on a high volume of mortgages, they can also secure volume discounts, helping to reduce the cost of your mortgage. They currently have 11 physical locations across Canada and you can also work with them completely online, over the phone or through email. I also think it's really nice that they work all across Canada from co to coast, so wherever you live or you wanna live, they can help you. The process is really straightforward. You don't pay them anything. Instead, you work with them and let them find you the lowest mortgage rate and your best mortgage fit. Something else that I think is really cool too is that they have an obsession for lower rates and they actually promise to beat any competitor's offer or they'll give you $500. So if you are looking to buy a house in the future like us and you need a mortgage, then check out True North Mortgage at the link that's on the screen. And if you have any questions for us, make sure you ask away in the comments below. Okay, back to Dennis. Okay, so just like Steph, I always thought of buying a home home is like the pinnacle of like family and like stability and kind of all that mingled together. And that's exactly what it was for me growing up, even with my own family. So when my parents were able to actually, you know, save up and meet that goal and kind of tick it off and actually buy a home, that was like a really, really huge deal for our entire family. I actually called my dad the other day to quickly talk about it. So let's hear what he actually had to say. Hello. Hello? I just wanted to call you to ask you what home ownership means to you. Uh, for me, there's a uh, different significance in my generation because we knew this is a long-term change. 
Yeah. But uh, the impact of the change, we were seeing it as a more of a saving okay. than of just giving our money to someone who I would say is enlarging their legacy. You tell me that I need, I should buy a house as soon as possible, right? That's usually the language that you're using. So why as soon as possible? When I see the equity that is in my home and knowing that if I didn't own a home, if I rented, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't have anything to show for it. But almost in your perspective, you're also like almost expanding your mind in a way. Yeah, your mind expands uh, to other things. Legacy-wise, it's uh, our legacy. We are trying to find ways of enlarging ourselves. I think that was it. I don't think I have any other any other questions. So for me, that's why my parents specifically want me to buy a house as soon as possible. And once again, after what you guys just heard, after what I just heard, I totally resonate with the emotions and where they're coming from. But I just personally, I don't feel the pressure to do it as soon as possible. You know, if you still feel the pressure to buy a home ASAP, then check out this video on why we're renting in the short term instead. And with that, we'll see you next week with a new video. Y'all already know the vibes and let's go.